Owen Wilson and Selma Hayek star in Amazon Studios' mind-bending film Bliss as an unfulfilled man and mysterious woman who believe they are living in a simulated reality and must decide what's real and where they truly belong. This February, chase something real. Amazon Studios' Bliss now streaming on Prime Video. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. There are no hidden fees or price hikes, and all websites are optimized for mobile. And it's so simple. Start with a design template and use drag and drop tools to make it your own. Head to squarespace.com slash StarTalk for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code StarTalk to save 10% off your first purchase. From the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and beaming out across all of space and time, this is Star Talk, where science and pop culture collide. Welcome to the Hall of the Universe. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And on our show tonight, our topic is forensics, solving crimes with science. So let's do this. All right. My comedic co-host tonight is Matt Kirsch. And Matt, hey. welcome back. Thank you. It's nice to be here. You're one of the comedy writers on The Jim Jeffries Show. That's right. Excellent. Yeah, it's a fun gig. I like some of his jokes. No, well, I'm just kidding. They're my ones. The ones you don't like are other people's. So that's just... <laughs> also joining us is forensic pathologist, Rebecca Folkerth. Rebecca, welcome. Yes. Hi, thank you. You work at the office of the chief medical examiner of New York City. Yes, sir. And you specialize in brain trauma pathology. Just so you know, just in advance, Anyone from medical examiner's office has always just a little bit creeped me out. Just yeah. Well, with good reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need your expertise tonight because we're featuring my interview with best-selling crime novelist Patricia Cornwell. She wrote her first novel called Postmortem back in 1990 while working in a morgue. And she went on to write 24 New York Times best-selling books and sell more than 100 million copies over forensic science novels. I think the Bible has only sold a few more copies than that, so this is pretty serious. <laughs> yeah, and how many mysteries has the Bible solved? Almost none, so. <laughs> so I asked her what sparked her interest in science, so check it out. You know, my chemistry teacher um, in high school was somebody that I've never forgotten because she was, she was the real deal. She loved it and she, she cared about science. She also was very patient with me because I was no good in chemistry. See, I fled from the sciences in school. I fled from all of them. I couldn't do math. Um, I, you know, I, when I did astronomy, the only way I couldn't get the relativity math problems. I got every time I get it wrong. This interview is over. I, it's <laughs> awful. I mean, me. This is what I do for a living, and I and I skipped science in school because, first of all, girls didn't do science. They didn't, and my my brothers did science, but I didn't do science. You know, and I wasn't encouraged to do science. And how I ended up falling in love with it, I'll never know. But it is, to me, it's everything. All right, so do I, do I understand correctly, you, you worked in a morgue? I went to work in one for six years. How old were you? I started there in my late 20s, mid -20s. Isn't that just completely creepy? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't like morgues. People think I love morgues. I hate morgues. <laughs> That's just really they're creepy. Awful. I mean, they're depressing, and it's hard work, and it's gross, and there's nothing pretty about it. But it's that's what you, I had to learn, technological study, hanging out in labs, learning about anatomy, learning about human nature, learning everything, what I call the, you know, the overview effect? Yeah. That's the underview effect. Ooh. The morgue. So I don't know if people know about the overview effect. It's, it's come... It's come of age in the era of astronauts. You don't see national boundaries. You don't see uh, ethnicities. You don't see religions. You just see sort of ocean and land and clouds. It's just the overview effect. So, so Rebecca, tell me about the underview effect. Would you, would you agree with this? I think that's a tremendous concept, the underview effect. Uh -huh. Uh, but it, what's interesting to me is that I think it brings us to a similar place as the overview effect, because the overview effect here, the astronaut is out uh, from far, far away looking at a tiny planet with 11 billion 
people on it, and we're yet, sort of at we're the, headed there fast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're at the uh, opposite end where we're looking at one individual and then looking with a microscope at their cells, trying to figure out what's going on with them, and it gives you this sense of um, sameness among human beings and, and, and a really sort of a, a, a wonderful humanitarian feeling to me. So, so I guess we and you bookend the human experience. Yes, I, I think so. And, and so I, I like the, the idea that we're looking at it from so far distant, but we're kind of ending up in the same place. I, I do have to ask, because when, when Patricia just then said in the clip that no mortar creepy, she doesn't like working there, you sort of, there was a moment I just caught your expression where you're like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not creepy. No, it's totally no, cool. No, it is creepy. It is. But... Uh, well, so what do you actually do? Well... Other than we, collect bodies and pull them out. Is it like in the movies? Like The big drawers. You, you, uh, well, you pull them out of the refrigerator? Sort of like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but what we do, uh, we're medical doctors, and um, these um, people are our patients. We're the last doctors to see these people. Um, so when you take and, the Hippocratic Oath and you say and above all else, do no harm. When you get a dead body, you're pretty clear on that one, right? Well, yeah, we don't so much have to worry about that. <laughs> but, but we're, you know, trying to figure out what happened to them uh, so that their families have answers, and there are right ways and wrong ways about going uh, so, about so what's that. the procedure? The body comes in. The what? body comes in. We examine it from head to toe. Uh, it's rather like a surgical procedure. It's just more involved. And of course, we're not fixing anything. We're just documenting everything that's there. But it, we use uh, many of the same tools that a surgeon uses. And as I say, we're medical professionals. And uh, so uh, it's, it's done in a respectful way. Just, so so uh, what's curious to me is that um, forensic science has become pop culture. I think in part because of Patricia Cornwell. I mean, I think she, she's, if you're on the bestseller list talking about this, people are talking about you. And so... I asked what her impression was about the role of her books as sparking public interest. Let's check it out. Well, what I did is I inadvertently made forensics accessible to people, and it had not been before. Nobody knew what happens when somebody dies. They really didn't. It wasn't part of pop popular culture. But you want to know how that happened, though? You know what, what got me interested? It was one thing that somebody said. The first time I had a tour of the morgue, after hours, all scrubbed and hosed off so it's nice and clean and sparkly, shiny steel, lovely, warm place to be. And this medical examiner, she starts telling me, I said, what, what's new? What's coming down the pipe for you guys? Because, you know, you've been doing autopsies for hundreds of years. It doesn't change very much. She said, well, there's this thing called DNA that they're just starting to play around with. And also, we're starting to use lasers to look for evidence on bodies. And I'm like, ooh. DNA, I don't know what that is. Sounds interesting. Lasers. Now, now you got my attention. That was what hooked me. It wasn't the dead people. It was the science that she told me. This was 1984. Mm. They would not use DNA. No, not yet. Until yeah. For several more years. Uh -huh. But that, and so I just arrived just and all this stuff was starting to happen. And I was just intrigued by it, using science to tell the truth. What happened to you? Rebecca, so give me an example of how forensic science just tells the truth. Well, science itself is the business of, of uh, uncovering the truth. That's the name, facts. sure. Yeah, and so we're just applying it to uh, the human body, and especially in a you know criminal justice uh, setting. Our motto at our office is science serving justice, and that's that what is we're cool. doing. Yeah. So what were some of the earlier methods and tools? Well, if you didn't have, uh, before DNA, what would, what would oh people... Oh, gosh. Well, yeah, as Patricia said, DNA is a relatively recent development. We do rely on it a lot, but the time-honored uh, tradition is the autopsy. And uh, that's how we, as I say, we, we uh, get to the bottom of things. We, uh, we have to see with our own eyes, with direct observation, what happened, uh, what natural disease was there, what the pattern of injury is. But you um, could miss something if... There's a chemistry test that you could do but don't think to do. Yes. Well, uh, we have uh, guidelines for running toxicology on cases just for that reason, so we don't miss them. Okay. So is that reliance on what the police officers who've done the initial investigation, will they then tell you, 
hey, we suspect this might be going on, so you might want to check for it? Or do you look for other signs that are independent of what the police say? Uh, it's, it's both. I mean, we have the evidence that the medical legal investigators uh, and police... Right, they can say we found us. drugs around them. Exactly, we have that. We can see for ourselves if they have evidence of self-injection, um, and we can see changes in the body that are characteristic, uh, for example, of drug use. But if you're talking about poisoning, we have to um, have you know, more suspe a specific suspicion of that to test for things like arsenic or whatever. But it comes, it comes up, it does. And, um, and some poisons have other evidence manifest yes, in the skin. Yes, skin changes, yeah. sometimes in the brain, different things we might, that might clue us in to, hey, maybe that's what's going on here. So you're one of those people that put the brain on the, on the meat slicer and look at no, thin no, slices no. of brain? No, we, we, uh, no, no, what, that's considered... What, what's wrong with that question? No. You, we've all seen that, haven't we? No. We all knew exactly what you were talking about. Yes, like, exactly. You said meat slicer and everyone's like, well, that's probably not the name, but we know it. it. And so I don't know about this. All but right. This, we all saw the movies. Where, but this is where the TV and the movies have it wrong, because oh. for, for us in neuropathology, it's, um, we are very particular about how we examine the brain, and we do it freehand. Um, so that we can tailor it very carefully to try to uh, get the most out of what we're looking at, both on the outside Without destroying and the, the inside brain. Yes, you have to be extremely careful. You don't want to destroy anything, and you want to be able to look through the microscope at the tissues later if you need to. So when DNA came on the scene, what's the biggest change that it introduced? Well, I would say it's had a huge impact in a couple of ways. Identification of remains is very important for individuals who uh, don't have identification on them or who die in circumstances where it's not possible you know, to ask their family members. So uh, we do about 100 such missing cases, uh, missing persons type cases per year. So I don't mean to get morbid, but in the day when they say, let me dispose of the body, but first remove the head and the fingerprints, and now you just have a headless body with no fingers, and that doesn't matter, the DNA will still get it. We, that's another circumstance in which we use it. Uh, dismembered bodies, um, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And for example, so I'm creep, after, I was creeped out by even that question. Yeah. <laughs> but let me put it in another context. Uh, after 9-11, uh, our DNA lab was one of the, uh, at the forefront of trying to identify all the remains. And our chief at that time, Dr. Charles Hirsch, pledged to the city of New York that we would identify every last human remain through DNA testing. And we've been doing that. And you fact, couldn't have otherwise done that. Without could not DNA. have you otherwise burned done burned bodies and crushed nope. and they've been there for nope. months as they slowly yes. recovered the... Uh, right. uh, even, dug, dug out the, the, the site. Yes, e even now, I mean, we still have a permanent presence down at the uh, at Ground Zero, oh. uh, our office uh -huh. that's staffed by forensic anthropologists for this kind of thing. So this is where DNA has done an immeasurable service to families. Is dental records still a thing? Do people still do that? Yes, dental records are very important, especially if you have an unidentified uh, person. It's, uh, yeah. Okay, so Patricia Cornwell's books they really birthed an entire generation of TV shows like CSI and Bones. And I'm just curious, how authentic is the forensic science in those TV dramas? Because those are highly praised dramas. One of, CSI even became a traveling museum exhibit where you would go in and, you know, for, for school groups, would go in and try to solve a crime using the uh, scientific evidence. So how authentic is it? What, what grade would you give it? I would give it about a B plus. It's it's uh, that's good. That's very high. No, it's 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 very. You know the tools they're using. They describe them uh, with great uh, accuracy, um, and uh, they're certainly the same tools that we use. And you know Patricia uses them a lot. Refers to them a lot in her novels, mm -hmm. and I actually appreciate that. She's in fact been a great friend to our office over the years, and. Uh, and I think it's fabulous that the public is getting to know a little bit about what it is that we do. Well, up next, we're going to explore the science of decomposing bodies when Star Talk returns. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wondry's American Innovations presents Mission to Mars. This season explores what advancements have been made and what it will take to send humans to Mars. On July 20th, 1989, President George Bush announced his vision for a manned mission to Mars. Nearly three months later, NASA published a complex 30-year plan to get humans to Mars. However, Congress refused to authorize the spending, and NASA's manned mission to Mars was grounded before it could even start. Over 30 years later, the power of government and big business necessary for such an undertaking is finally starting to come together. And now, the next chapter of Humankind's Space Race is on. If you're a Star Talk listener, you know that pushing the boundaries of space exploration is always a compelling story, and Mission to Mars brings that story to life. Listen to Mission to Mars from American Innovations on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or even one week early by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Wondery, feel the story. Are you always taking care of your family? Do you often take care of others and not yourself? Well, now's the time to take care of yourself because you deserve it. Teladoc gives you access to licensed therapists to help you get back to feeling your best, to feeling like yourself again. Sometimes we don't know how much we need to talk to somebody. Take it from me personally. During the entire pandemic, I have had virtual sessions and it has been such an incredible help. Now with Teladoc, you can speak to a licensed therapist by phone or video. Therapy appointments are available seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. local time. Hey, maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe you feel stressed or anxious or depressed or lonely, or you might be struggling with a family issue. Teladoc can help. No need to wait months to get a therapist. Teladoc is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy to change counselors if needed for free. Teladoc therapy is available through most insurance or employers and individual plans are also available. Download the app or visit teladoc.com slash startalk today to get started. T-E-L-A-D-O-C dot com slash startalk. You know you're ready to earn your degree, but you need a university that works with your busy schedule. At WGU, their programs were built to be flexible. WGU offers a quality degree program that's affordable, flexible, and even makes it possible to graduate faster. You can earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree for under $8,700 per year, fees included. What? What year is this? See what WGU's competency-based programs can offer you. There are no set login times and 24-7 access to most coursework, so that means you can earn your respected bachelor's or master's degree on your own time. WGU's low flat rate tuition covers as many courses as you can complete each term. That means you can use what you have to get what you want. Take your skills and use them to graduate faster. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash startalk. That's wgu.edu slash startalk for your $65 application fee waived. Bringing space and science down to Earth. You're listening to Star Talk. Welcome back to Star Talk from the American Museum of Natural History. We feature my interview with best selling forensic crime novelist Patricia Cornwell. And I asked her about that creepy research facility in Tennessee called The Body Farm. Check it out. Well, it's not a health spa and you don't want to go. <laughs> the Body Farm is two acres of land outside of um, University of Tennessee near their hospital there that po- people donate their bodies to science, and they let them decompose out there in all I, sorts of different I saw a special on this. Oh, yeah, it's been around for about 40 years. It's a, it's a huge dead body laboratory. And why do we do that? Mostly it's to answer time of death questions. In other words, that is the biggest alibi in any murder trial, is could you have committed that crime in the period of time it would have taken? You know, what, when did this person die? Time of death is very tricky. It's like quantum computing. Every time you ask it, it gives you a different answer. And it depends on the wind and the rain and how clothed you are, how much body fat you have. I mean, everything is dependent on something. And it can dramatically change your answer. 
So this just, this land and just dead bodies out there. You know, there. Well, there might be one in a car. There might be one in a pond. There might be one buried in a casket. There might be one hanging from a tree. One with maggots. Oh, the nature come, take, they have cameras set up. And yes, because we are lunch for these people. Okay, so Not it seems pleasant. to me and birds. you owe your body to the body farm. Nope. <laughs> um, no, I don't. I, I Listen, to be honest with you, the body farm is... I mean, I think it's I think it's a great utility for some of this stuff, but but there are probably other ways that we could learn some of these things. Rebecca, that seems like a pretty, an awesome way to get all the data you need. But she said, talking about other ways. What other ways might you gather these data? Well, we basically uh, see these kinds of cases. Uh, Pretty much every day. Yeah, except you get, you get a body that's partially decomposed that's brought in, but you don't know when the body started to decompose, which the body form will know, because they know when they put down the body. So they have data that you don't have. That's right. But that from those kinds of data, we extrapolate to our, you know, our cases. But what the kinds of data that we often do have are things like if someone has died in their home, we may have their newspapers piled up in front of their house and we'll know how far back that is. We'll have their mail. Mm. We may have the expiration date on their milk in their fridge. I mean, these are things that we use and we correlate. So every day we have those kinds of data. Uh, when the last person who saw them, uh, saw them, you know, who, when their family got the text from them. So we have enough data to often make those kinds of conclusions. That's a little weird now. Now that you're going to be looking in my refrigerator at my milk expiration date, I don't know. If that... Yeah, my milk. I've got some old stuff in my fridge. That <laughs> I, oh, right. he, I think he died in like 1996, <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there. Cause... So, Matt, would you donate your body? I, I would like to donate my body to science, and I, I want to find out more about that from you after the taping. But you're, I... you're not much of a meal for the maggots, well, you know? Yeah, exactly. So I might as well have some scientists have some fun. Although I think the main thing I want to do really is have some fun with the scientists. I'd rather try and confuse the coroners. Like, uh, be, like I think I want to die with a list in my pocket with a list of names uh, crossed off, and mine's in the middle of that list. Uh, and I want, to, I want to be covered in gasoline, but not burnt. Uh, and clasping a locket next to a broken birdcage and dressed as a centaur. So that's my plan. And just be like, work it out. See what you can do with that. So, wow. Okay, well, you just there's... publicly announced this. Yeah. So we got you now. Well, that's, that's the first draft. I'm going to switch it up for the real deal. But <laughs> try and match that to something in the Tennessee body farm. Like, oh, okay, no, we actually have that exact same thing as well. It turns out it was a comedian trying to screw with us. So we, we, did, um, we did a bit of research, though. I found that there are some other cool things you can do with your body after these are all real things okay go on these are um these are interesting ways to donate your body first you can be buried in a suit made of mushrooms and composted and you get turned into a tree i think that's quite a nice like green that. thing to do you sort of it's the circle life but immediate you can turn your body over to medical experiments uh, either officially or just find a well-meaning medical person online and say give it your best shot uh-huh. <laughs> you can be turned into a diamond I don't know if that's something that appeals to, as a scientist in you, um, or be turned into fireworks. I don't know whether you'd rather have that. <laughs> you can become an exhibit at Body Worlds, the touring body exhibit. Oh, oh. And that way you, you're around for a while. Right? Yeah. Uh, you can be turned into a vinyl record, which uh, sounds a lot better than being turned into an MP3. Uh, <laughs> You can be cryogenically frozen. Um, you can be launched into outer space. I don't know if that's something that a ch something they you might wouldn't want. launch. They would like take bits of you or totally cremate you so that you're lighter. Right. I think yeah. Space. I don't think they put the full bulk in there. They wouldn't want the water weight. But right. you know, just the they'll dehydrate you or something. Right, right. Or you could be put into a haunted house, uh, or a regular house that just becomes haunted because of you. So. <laughs> okay, that works. <laughs> But, but those, those are all different options. No, I, I like the diamond one, I think. Diamond, yeah, yeah. Pressure and time. Oh, There's plenty of carbon in our body, and the diamond is pure carbon. So how would that work? They, they presumably a mixture of heat and extreme yeah, compression. compression. You have to break every single chemical bond in your body to uh -huh. just leave the carbon behind. And then there's just this pile of carbon, and then they turn the carbon into diamond. Yeah, that'd be very cool. So you can wear your dead spouse on your ring, you know? <laughs> What? what? 
That's the creepiest thing you've heard today yet? No, I, no, I don't think so. We'll definitely get some strange Facebook comments when people post that picture, like, guess what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's not what you think. Yes. So, Rebecca, uh, are, are there stages of decomposition that, you, that you've broken it up into parts? Yes, more or less. I mean, it's, it's a biological process. Um, and how long does the whole process take? It varies a lot with the conditions. Depends on the heat, the humidity, if it's a dry environment, um, if you're in water, that sort of thing. But pretty much uh, the human body is, is skeletonized by about six, to, six months to a year after death. Again, depending highly on, there's a, on there's circumstances. There's a verb. I know, I was thinking that exact same thing. Skeletonized. skeletonized. Whoa, that just rolled off her tongue. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I asked Patricia Cornwell, what it's like to, on a personal level, emotional level, to visit a place like the body farm. And so let's check it out. It is surreal because you think you're on a battlefield because there's all these dead bodies everywhere. Some of them clothed, some of them not. Some of them are just the way they came from the hospital in their gown. Uh, one guy had committed suicide, but he had donated his body and, um, and he, was, he was dressed in the suit that he killed himself in. It was just lying there on the dirt. And that's... In a suit? Yeah. That's surreal. That he dressed up to take his life, that's what I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? That's, that's where the heart comes from, is if you don't go and visit with these folks, the dead, you don't deserve to write about them. And so I had to do that for years, going in the morgue. And, you know, not just when I worked there, but the research that kept going on and on and on. And I have to tell you, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It's really hard to do. It's hard. I mean, I could start crying if I think about it too much. It's hard, some of the stuff. And, you know, I've, I've, I've shown people what that is, and I sure as hell have shown them what it's not. And it's not all the fakery, and it's not pretty. And when you see, you know, Shelley's sculpted, you know, sculpture in University College at Oxford, the drowned poet, and he's all beautiful with his flowing hair, that's not what you look like when they fish you out. Sorry. It's awful. I learned such an important lesson because one day I was going down the elevator and there was a decomposed, a guy who'd been out fishing with his little boy. He fell overboard, probably had a heart attack. And he'd been in, it was summertime, and he'd been in the water for about a week. And I'm telling you, the minute I got to that building, you could smell it on every floor. I'm on the elevator going down because this medical examiner is going to get, is going to do this case. And I'm just already dreading it because, and I said to her, I sometimes don't know how you do this. And she said, I try to remember them before they were like this. And suddenly I saw that man in the boat with his little boy on a July morning fishing on the James River. And I thought he would be mortified, literally, if he knew he looked like this right now. So give it the poor guy a break. He can't help it. And I stood there the whole time and I scribed, took notes and mm. did my job with her. Mm. But I've always tried to remember that. Mm. Look beyond what's in front of you. Look at the person inside that person who's not there on that table anymore. And, and this is what he's left. This is his bloated, stinky space suit. And let's see what we can find out about it. Be respectful. Mm. Rebecca, what is, as Patricia noted, how important is it, for, maybe for your own psychological stability, to be respectful of the dead? Oh, absolutely. These are our family members. These are our community members. And uh, it's really... If someone's father, mother, us. sister, yes, brother. Yes, and we're the last physicians to see them. And um, that's part of our um, commitment to society and but, to but humanity. And to, to see this every day, so many times a day, to, to, yeah. does it wear on you? Do, do you need to put a... A, a, a layer of distance between your emotions and what you're experiencing? Uh, somewhat, but we more often support one another and help each other. You, and people in the, the field? Other, yes, our, our colleagues in the field. Um, and for me personally, I'm a Buddhist, and it's, uh, it's, a, it, it's a lesson in compassion for me every day right. and, and when like, I see them. And like you were saying before, it does feel like it's a level of everyone... Everyone ends up like this. Everyone yeah. looks the same on the table to we an do. extent. We're we all, all the same. So on has it side. changed your perspective of death? Yes, absolutely. I uh, I don't you embrace fear it more. It. You don't fear yeah, it. Yeah, I don't. I don't fear it. It's a normal part of life. Uh, you know, um, 
it's, it's it, impermanence is what we have to deal with. Do you get to choose who would do your autopsy? You know, like, like the way like hairstylists would be like in the do. salon, they'd be like, I, Marco's the best, so I want to have him do mine. Like, are you... Pe- people do do that, you know, for their funeral hairdos and that sort of... Right. Sure. Oh, no, we... Uh, I've had colleagues who've specified these kinds of things, absolutely. Your style's name Marco. Yeah. That's... <laughs> <laughs> well, up next, we ponder the scientific search for the afterlife when Star Talk returns. This is Star Talk. Welcome back to Star Talk from the American Museum of Natural History. We are discussing the science of death, featuring my interview with best selling crime novelist Patricia Cornwell. Check it out. Science does show us that we really can't get rid of anything, can we? It turns into something yeah, else. Yeah, it turns into something else. That's right. So it, it degrades, but it, it's something. Yeah, not all things are equal, but it does go somewhere else, right? right? When you die, your body temperature, radi- you know this, radiates to the air. The air then will radiate to space. That energy that was once you is still somewhere in the I universe. believe in eternity. I believe in infinity. I do not believe we end. And I would bet you my life on that now. I know my flesh is going to end, and it t- reminds me of it every day. Because as I get older, like, uh, I don't know how, I've, I, the time goes so fast. And I've seen so many dead bodies, I can't even count. And one of the things that I was struck with year after year... Most people go their whole life never seeing a dead body. I've seen thousands, thousands uh, of the worst thing imaginable. And I've seen people who are... That literally was just unstrapped from the electric chair and driven right over to the morgue and their body temperature is 106 degrees. And the blood is still kind of... Their veins are still standing up on their arms. They look so alive, but they're not. And there's something so missing when that person's not there anymore, that you realize that the spirit or the essence or whatever this is that we are, our consciousness, our intelligence is not really the same thing as this. It's not. And it does, it is not destruct, it's not destroyed. It goes, I don't know where, but it's, it, I'm telling you. Well, all you can really say is that it's not where it used to be. It's not where so it, it used could, to be. So it could have disappeared or gone somewhere else. I also think. But you're saying it's there. just not there. I'm saying that the body is, your body is not the same thing as you. Well, joining us now to discuss the concept of mind, body, and soul is neuroscientist Andrew Newberg. Andrew! Thank you. Thanks for having me. Welcome back to Star Talk. Thank you. It's been great to be here. So you're a physician at Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. Yes, that's right. And you're a pioneer in the field of neurotheology. Right. <laughs> what is, did you like make that a I think so you, you, you did so, so what is that it's basically the field that is trying to understand the relationship between the religious and spiritual part of ourselves and the biological part of ourselves and trying to understand how they interweave within us so this would be a neurological thing well it's both in this case uh, for me neurotheology is kind of a two-way street it's not just science or neuroscience looking at religion but it's also religion looking at neuroscience and how they can inform each other about who we are as human beings. So what have you learned about this concept of a separation? What do you have to say about this concept of a separation of the body from the self? Well, it, it's a fascinating problem in neuroscience because for the most part today, cognitive neuroscience sort of thinks of them as together, that the only way we can have thoughts is through our brain. But people have a lot of very interesting experiences that suggest just the opposite. Uh, When people have a mystical experience, they feel that they transcend themselves. They go beyond just their their physical body, and they feel that they experience the universe in a completely different way. Does that relate to near-death experiences? Well, and that's another kind, which are these out-of-body or near-death experiences where the person literally seems to get outside of their body. They often describe themselves as floating up to the the ceiling of the room and being able to see the, the hair color of the nurse in the room, or maybe sometimes even going down the hall and seeing a patient in another room and learning something about what's going on with them. And people have corroborated these reports, so there's something to them. The question is, what does it mean? Wait, wait, wait. When you mean corroborated the report, you mean more than one person has said this about their experience? There, there are actually thousands... Not that nurses saw bo- pe- 
things floating above Correct. bodies. Just Correct. want to be clear. That's, that's a good, okay. <laughs> it's a good correction. Just want to distinguish this. <laughs> yes, but when people, people go up uh, and they have this experience and they'll say, uh, there was an interesting report where they said they saw the, the doctor look like he was kind of flapping his, his arms like he was flying. And then when they talked to the doctor, they said, you know, were you doing something like that? He says, well, yes, I was because I wasn't sterile and I had a point to the other doctors in the room what they were doing. So he was making this kind of unusual movement. So that, that kind of interesting way of looking at what it is that the person describes when they are outside of their body. Now, I thought see. there was an attempt to do a more formal experiment on this where someone wrote something on a piece of paper, faced it up to the ceiling, mm -hmm. and it was something that you'd have to have an outer body experience above the paper to read. And no one was, in all these cases, no one knew what the hell was written there. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, one of the, the interesting possibilities with near-death experiences is the ability to try to very systematically explore this. And as you mentioned, the testing, been, yeah. there are some studies that have been done, uh, theoretically, if they go above themselves and they're resting in the corner, then if you put a shelf there above where their body is and you put a picture or something written, they should be able to see it. Part that would be a proper not a, experiment. It, what's that? Not a doctor doing this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I agree so far from what I hear, there have not been any hits yet in right, terms right. of uh, the accuracy of, of finding that. But just imagine what would happen if we did get one. <laughs> so, no, it'd be great. Uh, it's a, a new discovery, a new phenomenon. A new way of thinking so, about it. So tell me about the perception we have of soul. Is that, is, that, is that something we choose to believe in because of whatever religious affiliations we have? What do you think, that, so therefore it's a conscious psychological choice, what do you think some of that might be hardwired in the brain? Well, one of the things that's interesting about the concept of a soul is that it seems to go back to the earliest origins of the human species, even, even to Neanderthals, the idea of burying people 100,000 years ago with trinkets and with beads and so forth. It implied that they understood that there was something more than just the biology, of just the physical nature of who we are. So I, it seems like it's been something that's been in our brains for 100,000 years, maybe more. And if that's the case, we may not have much of a choice but to think about ourselves in a more spiritual way, not just what is what we see physically. So what's the history of research on this? Well, I mean, people have tried to see if there's a body's energy and, and, uh, and maybe tried to use you know, different modalities of imaging, whether it's through x-rays or other types of thermal studies. Because when x-rays were discovered right. back at the late 19th century, I mean, to, to the afterlife people's credit, they wanted, they thought, okay, if x-rays see through the body and a body, somebody's ready to die, let's set up the x-rays to see if you can see something leaving the body and rising up. And they, they didn't find anything. Right, but that presumes that you understand what a soul would be, that a soul would emit x-rays. No, it's the first, it's or, first pass. Yeah, yeah. X-rays see your bones and your right. and other things. They see through you. Right. And so I, I can't blame them for trying that experiment, but, right. but it failed when you talked about with your first question, we can talk about how our brain thinks about a soul and that that may be something that's ingrained within us, but whether or not that actually means that there is a soul, gotcha. bigger question. So right now it's time for Cosmic Queries. We took your questions about the scientific search for the afterlife. So Matt, what do you have for us? Okay, first question comes from Nate Gaudiso from Facebook and says, could the afterlife and ghosts just be reasonable science we don't yet understand. Ooh. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, what we can measure and what we can know uh, is just what we know today. And uh, every theory can be changed sometime tomorrow. So we have a long way to go to understand everything there is to know about the universe. Rebecca? Well, I... She means I no. I don't believe, yeah. <laughs> what kind of, I've already told you. That's yeah. a no. <laughs> I feel like that's the way you'd be leaning as well on this question, Neil. Huh? No, I just think I, I haven't seen experiments to justify the existence yeah. of, of, those of ghosts. Right. And I'm open. Show me the data. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. If, if the data is good, I'm, I'm good. But so, but the question was, could there be a way of scientific investigation that will one day show if the ghost? Fine, possibly. No, I have no problems with that. And I just wonder if that's the case. About a hundred billion people have ever lived, so you'd have like a hundred billion ghosts just crammed in all these spaces. And you need some way to dispose of the ghost. You need the Ghostbusters. Because <laughs> there's no room for all the ghosts. Unless if every dead human that ever was leaves a ghost behind. Unless they can stack in different dimensions. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> he's right, but I don't want to say he's right. <laughs> We've got time for one more question. Go. We, we have one more. That's from, this is from Dan Latham. It says, will it be possible to use artificial intelligence to create an artificial afterlife? If there's no heaven in the clouds, could there be an afterlife in the cloud? I got this. I got this. Once your consciousness is uploaded, then the concept of an afterlife is moot because there is no end of your life for there to be an afterlife. As long as the data stays intact. Yeah, so as no one unplugs the... <laughs> <laughs> well, up next, we dissect the mind of a serial killer when Star Talk returns. <laughs> Now is the perfect time to turn your cool idea into a new website. And you should do it with Squarespace. Why do I say that? Because I have used Squarespace personally to make two, actually three websites, and it was beyond easy. It was a pleasurable experience. You'll find what you need, whether you're showcasing your work, blogging or publishing content, selling products and services, announcing upcoming events, or anything you can dream of. Buying a domain from Squarespace is easy because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. And get to know your audience with their analytics tools, which include insight on page views, traffic sources, time on site, audience geography, and more. It's so simple too. Start with a design template and use drag and drop tools to make it your own. All websites are optimized for mobile right out of the box, so it looks great on any device. And every Squarespace website and online store comes with a suite of integrated features and useful guides that help maximize prominence among search results. So here's what you're going to do. Head to squarespace.com slash StarTalk for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code StarTalk to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash StarTalk. Offer code StarTalk for 10% off. Here's a big Patreon shout out to Ted Shevlin, Andrew Alquin, and Serge Rizzuto. That's right, Serge. We know who you are. Thank all three of you. And thank you if you support us on Patreon because you're helping to make Star Talk possible. The future of space and the secrets of our planet revealed. <laughs> This is Star Talk. But she's also taken a special interest in a real-life cold case, the infamous serial killer known as Jack the Ripper. Let's check it out. What's this obsession you have with Jack the Ripper? This is, you know, I... Is it still unsolved? No, I know who it was. What? Of course not. It's solved, honey. <laughs> yes, Walter Sickert. Really? The artist, absolutely. Really? I used science on it. Nobody ever bothered to try before. I looked at the only thing left is the letters that... The so Ripper you wrote. solved the Jack the well, Ripper question? I didn't solve it. The scientist that I brought into it solved it. And actually, it was Scotland Yard you that... You orchestrated the solution to that crime? Yes, because Scotland Yard came to me and suggested Walter Sickert, and I just did what they said, and I looked into it. They can't, they can't investigate that today. They can't, don't even have enough cops for the stuff that's going on now. So they can't be worried about a 104-year-old case, but told me all about it. I didn't know anything about the case. And I asked who the victims were, and he told me the ones that we knew of, who the suspects, ones that we know of. I said, based on what? said, nothing. Based on nothing. I said, well, is there no evidence left in the case? It's time for Patricia to take over. And he said, over. well, there's just the letters that Jack the Ripper wrote. I said, I didn't know he wrote letters. I said, I'd like to take a look at those. So I went over to the National Archives, and they put me back in this vault, this room with vaults and all this. And, and I got scientists to look, and we started finding paper matches between Sickert Stationery and Jack the Ripper's. Watermarks, measurements. I had the world's foremost paper expert involved. But it was, it was Walter Sickert. So Jack the Ripper, just to catch you up on this, 
Is the unidentified killer linked to a series of unsolved murders in London during the 1800s? And Patricia thinks she cracked the case, but others disagree. Re Rebecca, you specialize in looking into people's brains to find out what happened to them. Is there anything about the brain of a serial killer that you might be able to uh, extract from an autopsy? Uh, well, I hate to disappoint here, but actually an examination of a serial killer's brain is likely to show changes that any one of our brains could have or not have. What about the shooter in the University of Texas? Well, he had a brain tumor, so that's one of the rare exceptions, uh, okay. a malignant brain tumor. And yes, that would be one, one of the, that's what we look for, but one hardly ever finds it. Gotcha. Okay, this is the dead person's report. How about the live person's yeah. report? If you, if you could put a psychopath like Jack the Ripper in an MRI or an fMRI, functional MRI, what do you think you'd find? They've actually done that. Um, they've actually done a number of studies looking at violent criminals and psychopaths. And to, to simplify the results a little bit, uh, what has generally been seen is usually one of two basic kind of changes. Uh, we have a very strong emotional center, our limbic system, and we have our frontal lobe, which helps to control it. So when people are psychopaths or when they are violent criminals, either they tend to have uh, overactive limbic systems, meaning that they, their emotions just really kind of run away with them and they can't control what they're doing because of that, or their frontal lobes are not working well, so even though they may have relatively normal emotional responses, they're just not able to control them well. But it seems to have something to do with how they re respond to their emotions, which then allows them to kind of commit these crimes. Now, there's That's lots of... That's a start. That's an important start. It's a start, start yeah. right? There's, I mean, there's, it's not absolute, and there's certainly plenty of people who have limbic systems that run away with themselves and don't kill people. Right. So, we, you know, we have a long way to go in terms of truly understanding, but we're, we're, we're making some inroads into it. So her novels center on forensic science. Fine. It's a branch of all of science. But I had to ask her her thoughts on the wave of sort of science denial in America, something that I encounter in my uh, everyday life and in my presence on social media. So I just want to get another sort of perspective on it. Let's check it out. To me, it's like a virus or a malware that gets into human nature that makes people persist in believing nonsense like the flat earthers mm -hmm. or believing that, that, you know, photographs taken at the gantry back in the 60s, that that was really the moonwalk, that we didn't go. I mean, what does it take to prove, if you, you know, I guess unless you put your hand in fire and get burned, maybe then you'll believe it's true. <laughs> So I just feel this is a matter of life and death, that I have got to do something to get people to wake up to the importance of science and telling the truth and to do exactly what the word autopsy means. If you go to the Greek root, it means autopsia, which means to see for yourself. Science makes you see for yourself. It's clear and concise. Well, up next, my good buddy Bill Nye, the science guy, gives his take on the power of forensic science to solve a crime when Star Talk returns. This is Star Talk. Welcome back to Star Talk from the American Museum of Natural History, right here in New York City. We've been exploring the science of solving crimes. And my buddy Bill Nye, the science guy, has a dispatch for us from the Forensic Science Lab. Check it out. Perhaps because life is so short, many of us are afraid of death, and a great many of us are fascinated with murder. Now, a forensic scientist can't always tell why someone would kill someone else. But using the modern tools of chemistry and biology especially, forensic experts are able to determine who, what, where, when, and how a crime was committed. The word forensic derives from the Latin to make public or get out in the open. Now, this works because almost any place you go in the present, a crime scene especially, is loaded with clues about what happened there in the past. So nowadays, forensic experts can pretty much tell who done it. Uh, so, Rebecca, how hard is it to get away with a crime these days, thanks to the modern uh, work that you do? It's harder than it used to be, um, because we do have tools like DNA. Um, but you could probably have always said that at any time. There was, oh, now we can use fingerprints. That's a new discovery. And we, now it's harder than ever before. So, 
So is there a point where you say, okay, we're, we're plateauing here? It's not going to get... Well, I mean, we haven't reached 100% <laughs> solving of every crime, so... Do you feel like you could commit a perfect murder? Given what she knows, yeah. <laughs> she knows. Good question. Uh, no Be careful comment. how you answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a yes or a no? Well, I would never be inclined to, but... That's a yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a yes. Right, we, we need an inter interpreter for her what, for these, <laughs> under these situations. Uh, so, Andrew, what do you think in the future, how, like, neuroscience could be used to help prevent and maybe even solve crimes? Well, you know, theoretically, it's possible to do a better job. You know, get into some very interesting ethical neuroethics. They they refer to it. Uh, you know, could you put a, uh, little cameras in our in our brains so that we can actually see? You know, they have cop cameras now. I mean, could we all have something like that in our brain? Maybe, but is that okay? Is that okay to do? Um, but that would allow someone else to see through your eyes what you're doing. Right. Could that be a little invasive? How about yeah. a chip that prevents whatever neurosynapses? would make you commit murder right. from actually firing. You know, it's, it's If also, there's such a thing. Right. I mean, you know, it's a fascinating... I, I think about this a lot. You know, why can't you go into the, the jails and go onto death row and, you know, do some kind of transcranial magnetic stimulation, this new thing where, you know, you try to... That's a use, thing? That's a I thing. thought you made yes. that up Not on the fly. I, did, no. did he make that up? I would never do such that a thing That sounded like here. something out of Batman. <laughs> there's a transcranial <laughs> stimulator <laughs> off your utility belt, Batman. What? Believe it or not, it, and they're using it to help people with different psychological issues. So, you know, is it possible you could turn off those those emotional centers of the brain? But now, how comfortable would all, we all feel? I mean, what if you could do some kind of chip or surgery on Adolf Hitler and say, okay, let's, we're going to just send him back out into the world. Uh, I don't know how comfortable everybody would feel, even though we it can prove scientifically that we may have changed the way the yeah, person do you, thinks. Do you imprison people to punish them, or do you imprison them so that they don't commit that crime again? And, and also, who gets to decide who has criminal intent? Right. Who, that, that sounds like it's very open to abuse. Ah, yeah. he looks a bit criminally. We better put the chip in. Yeah, well, like I said, there's a lot of very big neuroethical questions for us to deal with, but they are fascinating. Well, crime author Patricia Cornwell is working on a new series about solving crimes in space. <laughs> so I asked her about her process of writing stories by seeing for herself... If you can write a story about space, how are you going to see that for yourself? But she likes being there. So I just had to get in there and find out. Let's check it out. I was on a rocket pad a couple months ago at Wallops Island. And you know what those things look like. They're just a bunch of grating and all this metal, right? And, and when I was standing there in this bitter, cold wind, I realized why you always have to show up. Because I was hearing the sound the wind was making through the metal, and it was playing like space music. <laughs> all this eerie noises. And if I had not been there and stood there, I would not have been able to tell that full story of what it was like to be on that launch pad. This is my method. I have to sort of taste, touch, feel, smell what it is. I'm, I'm a primitive person. I pick it up and shake it and hit, poke something with it and smell it and taste it and then realize it's arsenic and I shouldn't have, you know. <laughs> After the fact. So, but I, that's how I do things. I, I, it's, it's like my world is a laboratory. And my job is to be like Cassini probe. I'm just going to take in the data and fire it right back to mission control. Only my mission control is the story it tells. You know, when, I, when I think of dead bodies, I don't like thinking of dead bodies, but when I do, I, I, no one wants to die, really. And why is that? Could it be because we fear death because we're born knowing only life? And, okay, for me personally, when I die, I've thought this through. Don't cremate me. No. There's an energy content of your body. When you are burned, that energy is released from the molecules of your body. Molecules have energy contained within them. To burn is to break those bonds and release that energy. You then heat the air. The air then radiates to space. Your energy is still there. It's just scattered into space. And nothing can really use it after that. 
It's in the lowest form of energy there is. Radiative heat. So I say to myself, hmm, I've spent my whole life dining on flora and fauna as an omnivore. So for me, when I die, I want to be buried. Buried. I want to be consumed by the flora and fauna that I had spent my life dining upon myself. And in that way, I give back to the world that had given me life and sustained me. That is a cosmic perspective. You've been watching Star Talk. I want to thank Rebecca Fulters, Andrew Newberg, Matt Kirshen. I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And as always, I bid you to keep looking up. So you're ready to earn your degree, but you need a university that works with your schedule. Well, WGU and their programs are built to be flexible. WGU offers a quality degree program that's affordable and even makes it possible to graduate faster. Plus, you can earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree for under $8,700 per year. Fees included. That's right. You heard me. That is the correct. It's not. Nope. $8,700 per year. Let your experience and dedication help you earn your degree faster. See what WGU's competency-based programs can offer you. With no set login times and 24-7 access to most coursework, you can really earn a respected bachelor's or master's degree on your own schedule. The low tuition rate covers as many courses as you can complete each term. That means the faster you learn, the more you'll save. Get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash star talk that's wgu.edu slash star talk for your 65 dollar application fee poof gone waived for your 65 dollar application fee poof gone waived